Right now, we need to stop mass incarceration. We need to make some drastic change. Today on the Laura Flanders Show, the war on drugs has shattered too many lives to count. Author and journalist Johan Hari believes we misunderstand the problem. Then a glimpse of what fighting that war actually looks like up close with a profile of Reverend Kenneth Glasgow and his group, the Ordinary People Society, or TOPS, run by former prisoners in Dothan, Alabama. It's all coming up. Welcome. Why were drugs banned 100 years ago? Why do we continue banning them? And what really causes drug addiction and drug use? After leaving daily journalism, former newspaper columnist Johan Hari set out to find answers to at least some of those questions. The results are in his first book, Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs. The narrative takes readers to half a dozen countries and U.S. states experimenting with alternatives to criminalization and introduces us to a world of people none less fascinating than the man who kicked off prohibition for the FBI, Harry Anslinger, and his number one target, jazz great Billie Holiday. Harry started writing for The Independent in England at the age of 23. Since then, he's written for The New York Times, The LA Times, The Guardian, Le Monde, Slate, The New Republic, and The Nation, among others. Well, I'm really glad that your new book has brought you to our studios. Johan, thanks for coming in. So let's start with going back 100 years. I was sort of entranced to read your descriptions of Mrs. Winslow's syrup and <laughs> the sort of situation with respect to drugs before prohibition. It's fascinating. Drugs were legal in the United States, in Britain, everywhere in the world. If you wanted to buy opiates, you went to your local store, the equivalent to CVS. It was mostly sold in the form of something called Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup, which soothing was like a, syrup, that was it, like a kind of cough mixture. You could buy cocaine-based teas, you could buy cocaine-based drinks. And it's important to understand, there were some problems related to that. There, were, um, there was, of course, some addiction, just like we have addiction to alcohol. There were, it was not that big a deal. Mm. There were not that many problems. The vast majority of addicts had jobs. They were no more likely to be poor than anyone else. And really what you see, and I tell it through the story of this extraordinary doctor in California at the birth of the drug war called Henry Smith Williams, who really saw the changes that as soon as drugs were banned, all sorts of problems started to metastasize. They're transferred from... Uh, pharmacies to armed criminal gangs who suddenly have to be terrifying, they start having fights, you, you, suddenly the price goes massively up, so addicts are driven into addiction, uh, sorry, driven into prostitution, to property crime, you suddenly see this huge outbreak of all sorts of crime that wasn't there when they were legal. Now, Dr. Williams was up against quite an opponent, that's this Harry Anslinger guy. Can you tell us, what can you tell us about him and why was he so obsessed with Billie Holiday? Harry Anslinger, I think, is the most influential person who almost no one's ever heard of. Right. Most of the people watching this will have had their lives affected in one way or another by Harry Anslinger. He's the inventor of the modern war on drugs. He takes over the Department of Prohibition just as alcohol prohibition is ending. So he's got this huge department with basically nothing to do, and he wants to find it a purpose. And he's always been driven all his life by two really strong hatreds. One is of addicts and the other is of African-Americans. He was regarded as a racist in the 1930s by racists, so to give you a sense of how extreme he was. And he really became fixated on Billie Holiday, as I learned from his archives and from interviewing Billie Holiday's surviving friends. And, you know, 1939, Billie Holiday stands on stage, not that far from where we are now, and sings Strange Fruit, this song against lynching. And that night, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics tells her to stop and she refuses. Billie Holiday was a tough person. She had promised herself when she was growing up in the slums of Baltimore, she would never bow her head to any white man and she told them to basically go screw themselves. And that's when the stalking of her began. He first of all sends this guy called Jimmy Fletcher to kind of stalk her and the first agent he sends falls in love with her because she was so amazing. Oops sends her to prison. Uh, she said at the trial, you know, it was called the United States versus Billie Holiday and that's how it felt. She gets out, she can't perform anywhere because you needed a, uh, a license to perform. Um, you know, the thing she loves is taken away from her. But still, Anseling is not finished with her. When she collapses in her early 40s, she's taken to hospital here in New York. The hospital refuses to take her because she's an addict. They take her to another hospital. She says to a friend, they're going to kill me in there. Don't let them. They're going to kill me. They handcuff her to the bed. They take away. She's diagnosed with liver cancer. Uh, the agents handcuff her to the bed. They don't let her friends in to see her. I interviewed the last surviving person to be in that room. I mean, what they did to her was horrific. One of her friends, you know, she's actually given methadone. One of her friends manages to insist on it. She gets better. Ten days later, they cut the methadone off and she died. But here's the thing about Billie Holiday, and this really helped me to think about the addicts in my life. 
Billie Holiday never stopped singing that song. Right. No matter what they did to her, she would go anywhere they'd have her and she would sing it. And one of the things that really helped me was to realise addicts can be heroes. There's the everyday heroism of carrying on when you're in terrible pain, but there's also the heroism that I saw with Billie Holiday and a lot of other people of, you know, doing an amazing thing. All over the world, while we're talking, people are listening to Billie Holiday and feeling stronger. And yet, Mr. Anslinger's influence is still felt. Fast forward to today, and you go to Arizona, to the home territory of Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who's known for his roundups of people without immigration, legal immigration documents, and his treatment of criminals. You report on a female chain gang working there in the desert, and on a woman, Marsha Powell, who is literally cooked in a cage, they say. And you hear this from somebody and you say, huh? What do you mean? Joe Arpaio was a personal disciple of Harry Anslinger. When I mentioned Anslinger, his face lit up and he said, you've got a great guy here who remembers Harry Anslinger. And he'd worked for him, right? He worked for him. He was, he was promoted by Anslinger. Anslinger loved him. Um, it was really, it was one of the hardest, I mean, I went to a lot of dark places for the book. This was one of the hardest. Going out with these women on this chain gang who were forced to wear t-shirts saying I was a drug addict, forced to chant that the guards will tase them if they get out of line. But one of the most shocking cases, and this was not in a prison controlled by Arpaio, but it's in another place in Arizona. It's a woman called Marsha Powell who was a chronic meth addict. And when I started um, researching this, not very much was known about her, except that she uh, had, was constantly in that prison for either for using meth or for prostituting herself to get meth. And one morning she woke up in Perivol prison in 2009 and said she was suicidal and the doctor didn't believe her. So they took her out and they put her in a holding cage, it's a, which is literally a cage in the, the desert. And they left her there and she cried and she begged for water and she messed herself and they left her. In the end she collapsed when they called an ambulance. She had been cooked. She, she was, you know. And no one was ever punished for doing that, no one was ever criminally punished for doing that. And I think that tells you something about the thing that we saw in Billie Holiday's life, that addicts were not, mm. their lives were regarded as worthless. In fact, their death was seen as a good thing. That continues right to the present day. I then went and tracked down the, the father of Marsha Powell's kids to get the story of her life. And it was really heartbreaking. Like Billie Holiday, she had been a child prostitute. She was trying to stun her grief with these drugs. And the idea that that was the way to treat her is pretty... So that goes back to some of the um, assumptions that we make about addiction and drug use that are, uh, according, according to your research, wrong. It's not just your research, but the United Nations statistics on dependency were kind of fascinating. Well, there's two different bits to that. They're both fascinating. One is, uh, and this surprised me because it wasn't my family's experience, 90% of all drug use, according to the UNODC, the main drug war body in the world, is non-problematic. That's true even for quite extreme drugs. The vast majority of people who use them don't develop any kind of problem with them. That They're really functioning, holding down jobs. Doesn't cause any problem. Just like we know, you know, if, we, if I say to you picture an alcohol drinker, you picture a bar where there's loads of people, there may be an alcoholic in the corner and his life will be tragic and he deserves our love and support. But that's not, doesn't dominate the picture. But the most shocking thing that I discovered for the book and the thing that really blew my mind was that addiction is not at all what we think it is. If you had said to me four years ago, what causes heroin addiction? I would have looked at you like you were a little bit stupid and I would have said, well, heroin causes heroin addiction. And the first thing that kind of alerted me to the fact that may not be right was something that one of your former guests, Gabor Mate, said to me. He said, look, if you step out into the street and you're hit by a car and you break your hip, you'll be taken to hospital, you'll be given diamorphine, right? Diamorphine is heroin. It's extremely good heroin. It's much better than the heroin you'd score on the streets because it's medically pure. You'll be given, you can be given it for quite a long time, right? If what we think about addiction is true, that you know, that if we use the drug for 20 days, there are chemical hooks in the drug and the, then our body will physically need the drug, right? If that was true, and that's what addiction is, if that was true, those people would leave hospital and try to score on the streets. You will have noticed that your grandmother didn't become a junkie after a hip operation, that that virtually never happens. And I didn't really know what to do with this information when I first learned it, but then I went and interviewed an incredible man called Professor Bruce Alexander, yeah. who did an experiment that really, I think everyone needs to know about. The old idea of addiction, Bruce explained to me, comes from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. Really easy. Your viewers could do them if they're feeling a little bit sadistic. You get a rat and you put it in a cage. All alone. All on its own. And it should have two water bottles. One is just water and one is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself quite quickly. You might remember there was a famous advert in the 80s, a partnership for a drug-free America advert, showing that and saying, you know, it will happen to you. Um, Bruce comes along in the 70s and says, well, hang on a minute. We're putting the rat in an empty cage. It's got nothing to do. Let's try this differently. So Bruce built Rat Park. Rat Park is heaven for rats, right? Everything your rat about town could want, it's got it in Rat Park. It's got lovely food. It's got colored balls. It's got loads of friends. It can have loads of sex. 
anything a rat wants is down rat park and they've got both the water bottles they've got both the the normal water and the drugged water but here's the fascinating thing in rat park of course they try both they don't know what they are in rat park they don't like the drugged water they hardly ever use it they never overdose and they don't use in any way that looks like addiction or compulsion. What Bruce says, and there's human examples that I can get to if you like, but what Bruce says is, this shows us that um, uh, addic both the left wing and the right wing theories of addiction are wrong. The right wing theory is you're a hedonist, you party too hard, you're morally flawed and that's how you become an addict. The left wing theory is you're kind of hijacked, your brain is taken over. Bruce says, it's not your morality, it's not your brain, it's your cage. Addiction is an adaptation to your environment, and we can see that in all sorts of human ways as well. So if it's about the cage, and you say the problem uh, drug users are those who are in that cage, who through often no reason, no fault of their own, either trauma in youth, miserable poverty, dire distress of one kind or another, are falling into that category of the rat in the cage. How do we go about decriminalization without dealing with those problems first. If, if as you say, and, and Gabo Mate and others argue, addiction is an adaptation to a really troubled society, is it even responsible to decriminalize without dealing with that deeper trouble? Oh, I think you do need to deal with it. And I think the best way to talk about this is not in an abstract way, but to look at Portugal. So I spent time in Portugal. Um, 15 years ago, Portugal had one of the worst drug problems in Europe. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin. It was crazy. And they decided to set up a scientific panel that would figure out what, to, what would genuinely work. And the scientific panel came back and said, decriminalize everything from cannabis to crack. But, and this is the crucial second point that speaks exactly to what you're saying, take all the money we were spending on arresting drug users, imprisoning drug users, all of that, and spend it all on reconnecting addicts with society. Huao Gulao, the amazing doctor who led this, talks about how he wanted every addict in Portugal to wake up with something to do every day. Why are we not drunk now? We could be drinking vodka now, right? Good idea. We're, <laughs> we're not drunk <laughs> because we've got stuff to do, you know? And so one of the most effective things, part of it was residential rehab and psychological support, which are hugely valuable. But the most important element of what they did in Portugal was subsidized jobs, subsidized housing. If you used to be a mechanic and you developed a drug problem, they'll go to a garage and they'll say, employ this guy for a year and we'll pay half his wages. And the results have been extraordinary. You know, it's been nearly 15 years. Injecting drug use has fallen by 50%, 5-0%. Every study shows addiction is down. Uh, you know, one of the most moving interviews I did was with the guy who led the opposition to this move, a guy called Juan Figueroa, who's the top, top drug cop in Portugal. And he said the exact words are in the book, but he said, everything I said would happen didn't happen, and everything the other side said would happen didn't. He talked about how he really regretted that he'd spent 20 years prior to this arresting and harassing drug users, and he hoped the whole world would follow the example. So I think you're absolutely right, you need to deal, there's, there's one layer which is reconnecting addicts with society, there's a much bigger social change that needs to happen, but that's stuff that you and I believe needs to happen Anyway, I mean, we, something has gone badly wrong in our culture. We've created a culture where really large numbers of the people around us can't bear to be present in their lives. Yeah. They need to medicate themselves to get through the day. Now, that's an indictment of the whole consumerist world that we have built. And there's all sorts of reasons we need to deal with that. Naomi Klein's new book, This Changes Everything, which is an amazing book, explains why we need to deal with it in order to prevent the climate unraveling. This is another reason why we need to deal with it. I want to talk more about that, but before I do, you mentioned in passing that his exact words are in the book, and they really are. I mean, this is one of the most well-footnoted books. There's 60 pages of notes. You can go and <laughs> listen to the archives, and we know why. People who followed your career know why, that you had, uh, there were allegations of plagiarism, you um, apologized, you had to leave for your position at The Independent. Some people have called this book career rehab. Is that fair? I deliberately didn't think in those terms. I just tried to write the best book that I could write. What, what I did that was terribly wrong was sometimes when I interviewed people, I took things they had written elsewhere or said elsewhere and acted like they'd been said directly to me uh, in order to you know, assure people that that hasn't happened with this. Just, the audio is just all on the, the... So you can hear the people saying it directly to me. I think that's a kind of cool thing anyway because mm. so, there's so many amazing people that I interviewed that I think to be able to hear their voices is really a valuable thing. But yeah, I deliberately didn't. Did, it didn't. Give you, did that experience give you sympathy for those who were just not given a chance to move on and not given a second chance? I deliberately didn't think about it in relation to myself. I mean, I was invested in this issue from long before that happened, so no. Talk about fear. I thought it was very poignant, and it goes back to what you were saying about the society that we live in. You make the point that our vilification and criminalization of people who use drugs, our fear of addiction, is related to our fear of addiction. <laughs> is related to our fear of addiction 
to products to purchasing. Gabor Mate talks about his CD purchasing addiction. Um, talk about that a little bit. And if that's the case, uh, how do we break that fear? Well, we live in a culture where everything is geared towards consumption. You are here to consume things, right? The, from a very young, you look at, watch a child looking at advertising. And I think of addiction as like a subset of that. It's thinking that if you consume something and take it inside you, you will be okay. You know, it's a misfiring of consumer capitalism and the logic of consumer capitalism. And I think you're, you're totally right that this is a very problematic culture. And it, it really struck me going to the places that have moved beyond the drug war. The ones that have been really effective, like Switzerland and Portugal, are the ones that have really learned that and have looked at, yes, you help addicts, you know, so for example, in, her in Switzerland, they prescribe heroin to chronic heroin addicts. But that's in a sense like a holding pattern while you help them to rebuild their life so they can bear to be in reality. And I think that's really crucial. It's a really interesting question. Why does the drug war begin when it does? It's partly the race panic that we talked about with Billie Holiday. It's also partly the social fact, I think, the social factors that cause addiction are starting to massively rise. When do you see addiction outbreaks happening? You know, the 18th century, huge numbers of people in Britain are driven off out of the countryside into these disgusting slums, and you get the gin craze. Gin is regarded as like the crack of its time. You know, why does the meth craze happen? The, the meth craze happens because you have the collapse of rural America. Yeah. You know, why does the crack epidemic happen just after the collapse of industrial America and all those kind of jobs, you know? So where you have outbreaks of mass meaningless and loss of purpose, you will see big rises in addiction, and you'll then see panics about that. To go back 100 years again, one of the most poignant moments, or just mentions, one of the poignant things about the beginning of the book that you describe is that there was a, what you call a jazz solidarity. That for the most part, the jazz world stood by their own. They didn't allow the Billie Holiday targeting to happen to very many people. It's really moving, What actually. would be the equivalent of that today, do you think? I actually saw an example of this in Vancouver where there was an incredible uprising of drug addicts. You know, in the year 2000, there was a homeless street addict called Bud Osborne who was watching his friends die all around him. People were using in dumpster, behind dumpsters, you know, and they, to stop the police seeing them, but of course, if you, the police can't see you, if you start to OD, no one else can. And Bud thought, I have to do something about this. I can't just watch all these people die. He did a very simple thing, first of all. He arranged just for the addicts to just patrol the alleyways. So if they could spot someone ODing, they could call an ambulance. But that really empowered them because the overdose rate massively fell. They started stalking the mayor of Vancouver everywhere. Philip Owen, a kind of right wing Mitt Romney type, who, demanding that he open an injecting room. They carried a coffin with them saying, who will die next, Philip Owen? And after two years of stalking, to Philip Owen's eternal credit, he went and met a load of addicts, was completely blown away, and did indeed open the first injecting room in North America. You know, 10 years on, average life expectancy is up 10 years in that neighborhood, overdose is down by 80%. Yet Bud died last year, and when they sealed off the streets of the downtown east side where he had lived homeless and had this incredible memorial service, there were huge numbers of people there who knew they were alive because of the uprising that he began. And I would say to you, I know it's very easy when thinking about this subject to feel powerless, this is such a big thing, the war on drugs. You are so much more powerful than you know. A homeless street addict started a revolution in Vancouver that has transformed Canadian law and practice. There is so much that we can do to end this and save people's lives. Well, you've done a lot, Johan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chasing Laura. the Scream, the first and last days of the war on drugs is just out. Johan, I'm really glad you're back. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Laura. We're the next generation after the civil rights movement. Right now, we need to stop mass incarceration. We need to make some drastic changes. And that's why it's our turn to dream. It's our turn to dream in dealing with this mass incarceration. If we don't keep fighting, it's definitely going to continue. The Baptist Bottom is a real, real drug-infested, poverty-stricken area. And you would actually see a lot of people that live in the city of Dothan that would actually go four blocks north, south, east, and west and not even come to that area. So this is where I concentrated on cleaning up. I'm the founder of TOPS, the Ordinary People's Society. If somebody gets out of jail or prison and they don't have any money or anything, they can come here, we provide them clothes. There's blankets over there, TVs. We feed the hungry, approximately 200 people a day. I run the soup kitchen where we're at right now. By feeding people every day, it actually hinders them from going out to steal food from grocery stores or from any type of store or steal money or purses or anything from people. This is the fellowship hall itself. 
Usually we have it anywhere uh, from maybe 80 to 120 people in here uh, every Sunday. Uh, well, they help the neighborhood. Reverend Glasgow, he, he good folks. Job skills, GD, uh, resumes of the program director, counseling, substance abuse, uh, NAAA. It's not only coming from an outside point of view, saying, oh, I care about the situation, but it's coming from an inside point of view because I've been there before, and I know all the effects and all the feelings that you have from being incarcerated. I've been in jail myself. Me, personally, I'm a felon. More than 65 million people in the United States now have criminal records. And once you've been branded, once you acquire that record, it follows you for life. You can't give Pell Grant or student loan. You can't get public housing or Section 8. You lose your voting rights, and then you already can't get a job. So what it does is put you back in a scenario where you got to go back to your norm or something you used to do. That's hypocrisy because you pay your debt to society and you never are able to return them back to full citizenship. I'm about six, seven, eight years old, 71. So a little bit later than that, I start, I start seeing the drug war and all. When I came up out of high school, uh, people were talking about crack, cooking it up and all that. And I was really surprised that it was here, but it was. And I just started messing up and got hooked on crack. And I tried to get off it a couple of times and we'd go back to it, fall flat on my face, which led me into the 14 years uh, of prison that I did. That was one of the biggest regrets in my life. When he went to prison, I was nine. When he came out, I was 17 going on 18. When he came home, I just, I was ready for him to be a daddy. Like I told him, when he came home, he was like, what did I want for him? I was like, just be a daddy. I always heard that you look just like your daddy. You act just like your daddy. And I always felt like, well, if I look like him and I act like him, then what's wrong with me being like him? I'm already going through some of the same things that he was going through. You know, I, I wasn't on crack, but, you know, I, I was out here in these streets, living the streets life, doing, doing things that I know I shouldn't be doing. And Lil Kelly, my son, he told me, he said, hey, he said, Dad, I don't mean no disrespect. He said, but if you tell me everything you done did wrong, maybe I know what to do right. So that's what inspired me to go back to the bottom and clean up where I messed up. Conservatives need to figure out where they stand on local power. Their views present a paradox, suggested the New York Times recently. Causing the confusion are so-called preemption laws passed by states to undermine local governments from enacting their own policies. Eight states have passed laws scuttling local sick days rules. More have sought to preempt local legislation on things like cigarettes, taxes, gun sales, and plastics. Most doggedly, the well-endowed National Restaurant Association has worked to block cities from raising restaurant workers' wages. All this while jawing on about conservative values of individual liberty, don't tread on me, and the evils of big government. Hence the quandary. Curious, are conservatives for local control or against it? The answer is a lot more simple. Business lobbies see the writing on the wall. Even citizens in red states like Alaska, Arkansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota voted for raising minimum wages last time around. Philadelphia recently became the 20th place in the states to enact a law guaranteeing workers paid sick days. In the same month after rallies and protests and thousands of emails from local residents, New York's Governor Cuomo announced a raise for his state's 400,000 tipped workers. Cuomo knows a popular move when he sees one. Especially given the deadlock in D.C., voters want local government to take power back from far-off legislators and corporations and their lobbies. So it's no wonder that groups like the other NRA and the business lobbies cabal, the American Ex Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, have suddenly turned cold on local power and big on big government preemption. Paradoxical? Not really. When it comes to government, we've bought into a myth that there are moral principles at stake, big or small, federal or local. As the unseemly hypocrisy over local preemption laws reveals, the fight's really over power, and politicians, especially conservative ones, will do anything, squirm through endless contradictions to keep control of it. 
You can write to me, laura at grittv.org. And thanks. This week on the show, we talk with Monique Wilson and Agnes Pareo, two leaders of the One Billion Rising mobilization. It's not enough to actually just say we want to end violence without going into the what is causing it. And that is always the scarier part because you have to call out your perpetrators. An excerpt from a new film on the heroic women of the U.S. civil rights movement. I could hear screaming. I could hear the sounds of licks. In the case of the most severely addicted people, the injection using drug addicts, invariably it's driven by childhood abuse because uh, childhood stress and abuse shapes the brain in ways that make addiction almost inevitable. Mm -hmm.